Jen, if you could um, look, uh, sorry, share the agenda. Oh, and you put it in the chat. I see that. Thank you. All right, um, we have been fielding questions about transportation and it's um, what is required and what's not required. And I just wanna make sure that um, Nicole is here to give us an overview of transportation. Sure. Do you want me to dive right in now, Erin? Sure, do you wanna share your screen? Um, no, you don't need to. Okay, well, you can, um, Put the screen, you can stop sharing the screen then, Jen. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so transportation is very important. Uh, the bulk of the questions or unsureties that we receive are really directed towards transporting just general education students in the public pre-K classrooms. Um, so the resources and information that I have are directly related to that population of students. When a student has an IEP, um, the need for transportation is a requirement and it's, it falls under a slightly different sort of expectation, I guess. Um, but as far as our general education population of four-year-olds in Maine, uh, transporting them to and from their public school program is optional. It's not required for a school district to do that. Um, if and when a district dis determines that they do have the capacity to transport their four-year-olds, um, then it's recommended in chapter 124, section 14, it's recommended that schools follow the national highway safety, transportation of children, et cetera. Um, but again, not required, right? So it all sort of just hinges on that language that's in chapter 124, as far as I'm concerned and, and what we provide for districts for support. Um, so with that said, there are districts that transport four-year-olds on their school buses as they would any other child in any other grade with little or no safety harnesses, extra adult support, et cetera. It's possible, it's done. It doesn't mean it doesn't come up without its concerns um, or without its hiccups along the way, but it, it's doable. Um, there's also a, a expectation that transportation staff have a training um, around transporting young children as well. So folks that work in transportation departments at your schools will likely know more about that and, and who to contact for access to those trainings. Um, but also there are a number of districts and I don't have we don't collect this data, so I don't have numbers to say a certain percentage or one way or the other, but there are many districts that in recent years have utilized funding to um, amp up their transportation services for four-year-olds. So they've used funding to add safety harnesses to their school buses, or they've purchased uh, or leased smaller buses, or they've purchased or leased uh, vans. Um, to, to transport just the four-year-olds. Um, there's also a number of districts that provide transportation and will have an extra adult available on the run um, in addition to the driver. So that, you know, obviously the driver needs to do what they need to do. And the additional adult is there to support the students um, as needed. And not just the four-year-olds, any child that's on the bus, I would imagine. Um, sometimes that is protocol for all transportation of four-year-olds all year long. Sometimes that's protocol just for the first few weeks of school as the school bus runs get, you know, to their normal routine and times and, and houses and kids and get to know each other. And then they'll pull the adult. Um, I, I know of cases that have done that successfully as well. My light just went off. Um, we do ask every year for public schools to give us information around whether or not they transport, but not how they transport. So I can tell you that the large majority, about 75% of school districts that have a pre-K program do transport their children to and from school. Um, even our half day programs will run a midday bus run to accommodate their, their families and their communities. Um, as far as resources goes, 
We have the language, like I said, in chapter 124, that is recommended if you choose to transport your, your children. Um, but then our transportation website at the department offers additional links to those national highway safety, et cetera, um, where you could get some more definitive language. Um, yeah, so I may have opened a can of worms. I don't know, <laughs> Megan? <laughs> I just wanted to, to check to make sure that like, I appreciate this overview because it's one of those things that always feels like it's unmanageable. So hearing about how it's been managed is really helpful. Is everything that you've just outlined consistent between four-year-olds and three-year-olds? Are there any nuances we need to keep in mind for three-year-olds or are they the same? I, I have never had a resource for three-year-olds. So um, I would I would refer to the National Highway Safety language to see if that specifies an age um, or it may be specific to a child's height and weight for the requirement for a, a five-point harness. Um, and, you know, we could have a four-year-old that weighs 30 pounds just as easily as we could have a three-year-old, right? So it may not be age-related. It may be size-related. Um, I just want to chime in as well. In most national contexts, three-year-olds are considered preschool age children. And I think that's how they acknowledge that nationally preschool age children are three, four and five-year-olds. And so even though um, we've been designed in Maine to only think four-year-olds exist, <laughs> not really, but you know, the preschool age child is from three to five. So I just don't want people to feel uncomfortable transporting three-year-olds at this point. Um, and we're going to make sure that um, if you need some support in that area, we can work with you individually. Um, there's a lot of nuances to harnesses I'm hearing. Um, I even, we were with our MADSEC group last week and they brought up some things about harnesses. This is a great thing to um, go back to your superintendents groups and your MADSEC groups, your regional groups and talk about who's who's transporting little people and how are you handling that because i do know that a lot of times they just show up on a bus and they're with high school kids and everything goes fine and i think uh, nicole you had said your children rode the bus without seatbelts and it all went well so i um it's not it's not um a requirement though it's not mandated i just want to make sure people understand that Any other questions about transportation? Of course, we're going to, in our email to you, link out the um, all of the necessary links to all of the different laws that we have to um, help you understand. Um, and now we have Susie Perry, who's going to go over two more scenarios with um, with preschool children and placing them in programming or not. Go ahead. We can't hear you, Susie. There we go. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Is this little, is there a thing on here that needs to go away? No, there we go. Screen sharing. Okay. So, when we um, talked together last week, we had two additional scenarios. Today we have um, the last of the seven, but I think we're thinking about after conversations with you, with um, you know during these meetings that there may be some additional ones that could be helpful. So um, we'll uh, possibly continue to offer a couple more scenarios as they come up. And everybody did a great job last week of. Um, Kind of extending their your thinking around some other potential opportunities or ways to support um, the placement of children in an inclusive setting or in a setting in your community or considering settings outside of your community. So today's um, scenario is um, a four-year-old child who is currently in a child care program and they are in that program for 30 to 40 hours per week, and that program is inside of the district boundaries. And the family says that they want full day childcare because the parent works. The special education needs on the IEP are um, three hours per week with special education services, uh, special, oops, sorry, 
Is that what happened here? With special education services, um, uh, that specially designed instruction that need that he needs. And the IEP team says the child also needs a program to have access to a free appropriate public education. Uh, the district has a special education classroom for preschool age children with disabilities. Right now in this particular scenario, um, hypothetical scenario, they have a self-contained classroom. And uh, there is also licensed childcare within the boundaries of the um, school, uh, the SAU. And the decision of the IEP team was, um, took place after a discussion with child, the child care center. And the FAPE offer is for the child to remain in the current child care setting. And the district will deliver special education services to the child in that setting. And so they looked at what were the, um, sp the SDI needs, the specially designed instruction that they, the child needed, and then what additional hours the IEP team thought that the child would need. So in this case, it was um, seven general education hours to help extend and, and have an opportunity to apply those new skills. And um, the parent would be responsible for the remainder of the time that the child is in childcare. So if we add up seven and three, that's 10 hours, but the parent needs 30 to 40 hours. So anything beyond the 10 hours would be the responsibility of the parent. And the IEP team recommends, um, in this case, a are the, we're kind of getting into the code uh, side of things. So it's a regular early childhood program because we consider all of the time that the child is in a program. And in this case, it's more than 10 hours per week or 10 or more hours per week. And so the LRE code would be uh, this here that you see, REC 10 services. And um, so the next steps for the district would be to complete an MOU between the district and the child care setting, enroll the child in the district, as a student attending a public school in the resident SAU. So that's kind of alludes to the language that you see in the student information system um, when you're enrolling a child. Are there any questions or comments about that particular scenario or are there things that that brought up for you or that you're thinking about or questions? Okay, great. In this next one, we're going to ask for a little bit more participation. So what I have done is left off some portions of the um, scenario so that we're going to set up the context and then we'll have a discussion about um, what these last four items would be on here, what the decision of the IEP team might be, um, the placement that's determined, the code, and then any next steps for the district. So we're gonna ask that you um, talk together, talk with us, talk out loud, share ideas. Um, that's the design of this is to help us to practice and apply some of the thinking that we've been um, kind of modeling as uh, for the last couple of weeks. So in this scenario three, the child is a three-year-old and they have been at home. Um, they um, the child has been identified as a child with a disability. And the parent, when they talked to the parent, um, she said that they wanted the child to have interactions with peers in a preschool program. She thought that would be important. And um, on the IEP, the IEP team said that the child would need three hours per week of special education. And the IEP team seat says that the child needs a program to generalize communication skill development. And then the district looked at, well, what do we have within our boundaries or in, in, in our community? And in this case, the district has a full day and a half day pre-K program and local childcare programs that are two stars. So the, there are possible locations for delivering services. So what I want us to do now is to talk a little bit about, well, what might be the decision of the IEP team? And if you don't want to say it out loud, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Um, we can monitor the chat, but we'd really like to have some ideas about some things, or if there is 
Additional information that you need in order to help you make a decision will make up something for the scenario to add to it. And I see uh, Lou has his hand up. Hi. Um... I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that there's not a public pre-K that offers programming to three-year-olds so that you'd probably be deferring at that point to local child care programs. Not that they couldn't, but I don't know any that actually serve three-year-olds. That's such a great point. And um, I don't know, maybe Aaron or Megan, what do we, what are our thoughts about serving children in existing public pre-K programs? I think that we had mentioned that multi-age classrooms are a great idea and that you can, um, look, Sandy wants to say this though. Yes. <laughs> yes, we have been in our conversations encouraging people to think about, remember though, that your ratio is your ratio. And Nicole will correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's 16 to two. Yes. That was great. I was, I'm very happy I remember that. But um, so if you have, let's say, 14, five year or four year olds, or maybe some that are close to five that are in your program, then you would have potentially two seats for three year olds to come in for a short amount of time. These classrooms are very successful. The three-year-olds tend to gain a lot of skills trying to emulate the four-year-olds. <laughs> I'm, I'm told that this is done nationally with a lot of success. And we've been recommending that. So if you want a six hour program, you could do um, two three-year-olds, two three-hour points in a week, and that would um, fulfill your obligation there. Go ahead, Sandy. Well, I'm going to pick on uh, one of our cohort one schools um, that at the last minute realized they did not, our, their local Head Start did not have a, enough staff to run a program. And so on the spot, they had to figure out how to serve the three-year-olds um, that were coming into their, into their SAU this um, fall. So I'd like to um, ask Renee Foley from RC29, which is in Holton, what that looks like in your district. Sure. Um, that is exactly what happened right before school started. We had to be flexible and shift. And, and so we have two three-year-olds right now that have joined our pre-K program. One in the morning comes um, and has half an hour of SDI and then half hour with um, peers in the pre-K classroom, re receives related services. Um, and then, then she goes home and we have another child doing the same thing in the afternoon. And it's working beautifully. So it sounds like you could have like Lou was suggesting that the child could go to a local childcare program outside of the district or that there's been some examples now of children being able to attend the pre-K program, which ordinarily would only have four and five-year-olds. So that's, that's great. We're expanding on some of the options for locations for services for preschool age children. We also have um, two, three-year-olds in a local daycare that we are servicing by pushing into that daycare. That's amazing. So we're, now we're starting to hear about some additional, so that just the, the many different ways that um, preschool special education services can be delivered. And I see that Lori has her hand up. I just wanted to just thank Renee. I was part of the meeting with Sandy when we discussed this. And I think being in CDS for as long as I have, what would have happened prior to this is those children at Head Start would have gone on a wait list and they would have stayed home. And so this is why this work is so important and why I'm so excited to be part of it and so excited that you're all part of it because this district stepped up. They had to create something really quickly and they did it. And now children can go to school and get the services that they require. So it's just, it's really awesome. 
it's it is so much fun to watch um the three-year-old is making gains leaps and bounds so it's uh fun I love hearing that, Renee. I heard that story. And I'm sure that you had a lot of trepidation around that, not having ever done it. <laughs> and I'm sure your teachers were like, oh my gosh, we can't do this. And then you're like, you get it. When you see that three-year-old connecting with programming, you all of a sudden have an understanding. You have two years to work with that kid now, with that kid, uh -huh. that child to get ready for kindergarten. And that is going to be a game changer for all those kids who wouldn't have gotten services. Joe, go ahead. So Joe Fang is superintendent here in RC29. Um, and I think the biggest concern also was staffing, right? I mean, for those of you that are trying to figure that out, and, and of course, we understand that this model keeps changing or the funding keeps changing. And uh, we were not aware when we went into this and we kind of signed the deal, we thought, yeah, we won't be working with three-year-olds, right? We're going to go push in. And this happened really fast and it, and it, and it worked. Um, but tomorrow I meet with three ed techs to hire, uh, because we're trying to catch up. Right. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, so I think that's the piece. And, and I, and I just want to say that the most important thing is if these kids did not get services, how far back, you know, would they be when they jumped into our pre-K program? And that's the biggest thing that I have to let my board know that this is working and that I hope at the state level, we let whoever else needs to know about the funding model, that this is important to capture this type of data to put into that funding model for the future. Thank you. And Lou. Oh, you're on mute. Yep. Joe and Renee, this is wonderful news. I mean, I'm thrilled beyond belief because uh, not only in your instant case where kids would have gone on waiting lists, but having sat through various regional superintendent meetings, the superintendents that I've worked with obviously are scared to death of three-year-olds. They're also scared to death of four-year-olds, but the fact that you are you know, willing to uh, expand your four, four and five-year-old program to three-year-olds, I think is marvelous. I don't think there's any reason we can't do that. But Joe, you might wanna go on the road to some other regional super groups and get the word out that it's all very doable because they're scared, so scared of three-year-olds and really four-year-olds too. So thank you too, good job. And I can't say enough about our pre-K teachers who just jumped right in with both feet and said, what can we do to make this all work? And they've, it's been a fantastic team. Thanks, Renee. And Megan? Looks like uh, Aaron just clarified what I was going to clarify about Nicole's comment uh, earlier about uh, payment for three-year-olds. If you decide that you're going to be enrolling three-year-olds who do not have IEPs, of course, they are not included in the EPS formula. However, if you do have three-year-olds with IEPs, obviously they're part of the account um, for the special education, um, preschool special education fund. So um, that that will be covered there. Okay, well, such a great, um, rich discussion with so many people really sharing um, some successes that's very heartening for us and for um, accolades for this whole group for the progress that they're making. I'm going to go on to the next scenario and well, actually I'll show you what we had thought would be um, kind of our answer in our hypothetical situation would be that the child would attend the district half day program two times per week and the parent would transport. The services would be delivered in the pre-K classroom and special education would be responsible for all of the costs since the IEP says that the child needs a program. And um, so ultimately the next step for the district would be to enroll the child in the district program. And um, so there we go. Our next scenario is a three-year-old child. Um, this child needs a service, for example, speech. The parent is not interested in a preschool setting and does not have a car. The IEP, the special ed needs on the IEP were that the child would need 20 minutes uh, three times per week, and the child does not need a program. 
the district has a full continuum of placement options, a head start, and childcare to offer inside the district boundaries. What kinds of discussions and what kinds of things um, might this IEP team uh, decide for this one? It's a little tricky, right? I see Lou, Lou, go ahead. There we go. Yeah, and the IEP team determined that the child does not need a program. I'm assuming then that this is simply a single service, three time a week speech therapy, probably in the speech therapist's office or whatever clinic is available because the determination was no program was needed, correct? Yes, yep. And so that is a possibility. And um, so when we think about the placement on this one, and the code on this one, this is one that um, we are trying to emphasize the definition, how, the, how we define um, a service provider location. And so the code service uh, provider location is SPL. And um, I'm gonna stop and, and, and recognize Aaron. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to build on Lou's idea of another thing that you could do would be to add the child into a group you already have in preschool. So that might be something that the team decides and might be the best for your school district, your SAU, sorry, is, you know, you know, you have a little speech group happening three days a week in the morning and the parents can elect to bring them there. I just want you to kind of have all the options and all the different places you can, the parent may be like, I'm more comfortable sending to a clinic or there's a speech therapist that comes into my daycare, whatever it is, um, I think. But that idea of bringing kids into school for treatment might also be, I used to do that with the private schools as my friends in York remember and allow those kids to come in and start getting used to the other children in the school, in the SAU. Right, so start building some capacity for being able to tolerate more kids. And and um, it is, you know, three-year-olds, parents, I mean, thinking about putting their child on a bus and going to a preschool program is scary for them. And so, um, you know, helping them to start to make some inroads in and see how it's really benefiting the children, like we heard in the last case that, um, um, participating in a program really has a positive effect on their development. And however, it's not for every kid. And, and in this case, we thought that, um, let's see, what what did we, is, did anybody want to add anything else before we take it looks a like There are a couple of notes in the, the chat. I just want to make sure we highlight. Okay, great. And Leanne has her hand up as well. Hi, thank you. Um, and I guess my question is about around transportation, probably because we're a teeny tiny little district and um, very remote and we have lots of parents who don't have a car. So if we're saying bring them in three times a week, they can ride in on the bus. What happens when they're done with that program after an hour? That That's kind of where we're a little stuck. Right. So oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Erin. Um, you know, transportation can look different. Um, you can hire a, a transportation company. You can pay a taxi. You can put the parent and the child in the taxi to or an Uber to come to the program. Um, if the parent is able to um, obtain transportation on their own, you can reimburse the parent for those transportation costs. It doesn't have to be that the district, um, you know, drives out the big bus to bring the three-year-old for a half an hour to the program. You know, we want to look at some efficient and effective ways of um, providing transportation. And, you know, the transportation is designed to ensure the child has access. So the first question that we ask families 
in, in IEP meetings, you know, very early on in the IEP meeting is how do you plan on uh, getting your child to the to the program or to the services that we're offering and asking them to elect to think about, you know, well, what are some options that I have to get them? And if there are no options, then that's the barrier. And, you know, we have to cover that barrier and to enable access to the free appropriate public education. So, um, you know, we can kind of think outside of the box within all uh, the legal options. And some of them uh, might be things like um, public transportation or Ubers or ride shares or um, sending a therapist to the parent's house, or maybe there's a therapy location that it's walkable for the parent. So, you know, you really have to kind of dig in and get some more details. Lou? I, I would severely caution people about Uber rides for three-year-olds. I just... Well, not by themselves, with the parent. In... Mm. In, in with the with the parent I, let me I tell you who's an expert on transportation for this age group is everyone in cds <laughs> <Because> <laughs> right. we have had to try yeah. to do this we have done everything imaginable because some places like andover like it's funny when you say i want to get an uber because there's no <laughs> ubers in andover right like there's no way right. One of the things we have done is provide a hardship waiver. We've had people get their relatives on board. Um, I have a relative who can transport, but it's a hardship for them. They have to leave earlier. So I'm going to, and we give, we're just going to tell you to be transparent. We give um, $25 a day on top of mileage. And that's how we handle it because, and that's very helpful for some families to have that little extra income for the week. So that's something you really have to think outside the box. Who do you know who has a car? Is there any relative? Do you have um, a Nana who can drive? Who's still hey, Aaron, just, just as a point of clarification, when you say we, you mean um, in, in your work with CDS that CDS has provided those $25? Yeah. Yeah. If there's a hardship stipend, in other words, they have to, it's called a hardship stipend. And it's basically something that is a significant hardship for the family. It's a, an extraordinary amount of time. It's a relative doing it. Um, and then we make those decisions through an approval process. It's not, it's something that we, you know, really monitor, but it is a way to get children to their services if there's a relative or someone. And again, typically, if you're transporting a child in somebody else's car that's not your parents, you want the parent to be able to go with them. You don't want to, um, you know, send a three year old on a ride share like on their own. So there also is Medicaid transportation, main care transportation that we can look into. Um, and, you know, we're really looking at potentially expanding CDS's own capacity to transport too. So these um, look to your, the um, CDS community that's been trying to get these services or get transport. It's a, it's a ha it is a very challenging thing, even in CDS, um, but they have very many creative ways of solving that problem. So ask in your area, what has CDS used? Is there an organization that they can go through we um we have those people who are providing transportation and we can share that information with you another thing that i was thinking of it says here that parents are not interested in the preschool setting and is that changeable so is it possible that you know over time the parent might think hey, you know maybe it is a good idea for my child to attend the school district program and uh so that might change the whole transportation conversation in the future. So, you know, thinking about this is may not always be the way it is and how might you help the parent to um, change, you know, some what their current understanding is of the preschool program and, and maybe it would be better to have a program. So we said on this, whoops, back so we said on this one uh oh there it is that the um special education services will be offered at a therapeutic setting 
The parent does have act, doesn't have access to a car every day. Therapy is scheduled. A bus will transport the child or parent reimbursement for allowable transportation costs will be provided on a scheduled basis. So we looked uh, at trying to find a way to transport the child through some um, transportation, you know, company. And um, so this case, the child is eligible and will not be attending any other preschool or child care program. So the code for that is SPL, service provider location. And that's important that the child is not attending any other preschool or child care program. That's the only time that you would use this and they're getting a, a service. And so the next steps for the district were to enroll and arrange for transportation and services, enroll a child as attending, uh, being in the district of residence. Erin, um, I'm going to stop there and see, do we have time for one more or do we want to you, do the next one more the next time or how are we doing? Yeah, I think we should do one more the next time. I think we should move on to okay. um, our next topic. Yeah, I'm having a hard time reading the, um, I think we have to get a different format of copying and pasting our agenda because I'm having a hard time reading it, Jen. Um, the pathways to partnership was someone from the early learning team going to be sharing that? Yeah, I was, Aaron. Oh, thank you, Michelle. You are welcome. I didn't see your name there. Oh, there you are. It's just not connected. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that um, I am putting together a series um, designed to really connect um, school districts and community-based providers on building um, partnerships and relationships um, one of them is going to be obviously um, an outcome to help with some of this, um, you know, serving three and four year olds that are currently in community based settings. Um, and so there is um, the link is in the agenda to sign up. Um, and there are mini grant upper, there will be a mini grant opportunity at the end of the series. But the series is really designed to um, start facilitated discussions between school districts and um, community-based licensed providers, family child care providers, um, child care providers um, in talking about partnership and relationship building um, for, for many reasons, one of being the, um, the taking on of the FAPE responsibility. So um, there's more information. There's an information session tomorrow night. Um, well, tomorrow at four, not night, but um, in the link, I believe um, Jen put right in the agenda for everybody. And um, I will also say that the name is scheduled to, to possibly change. So it might not be um, pathways <laughs> to partnerships, but it will be something similar um, and um, yeah, so it, it's a really a great opportunity to just start building those um, relationships, learning from other school districts about um, partnerships that they've done and um, just start reaching out to find out who is in your area and what they do. Thank you. This is um, our person who can help you connect with places you never knew existed near you. So please do reach out, Michelle. I don't know if you wanna put your email in the, um, I, before I started this work, didn't know this position. I mean, I knew Michelle, but I really didn't understand what her position is. And then I'm like, we need you, cohort one. <laughs> um, all right, let me just check the agenda. Next is just updates, Erin. Okay, so S Sandy, are you doing the update on the BDI training? Oh, it's just that it's been canceled. Yeah, it's been canceled. Um, the trainer had a family emergency and our in-person training for tomorrow has been rescheduled for September 26th. 
same location. Uh, I sent out an email this afternoon. Uh, please reach out if you have any additional questions. It'll be a full day training instead of trying to make it a two day training. All right, I'm going to discuss the C to B transition. That is the time we have 60 calendar days. The timeline for evaluation is different in this age group. So don't forget that. And during that transition, because I had a question about this, it's actually the SAU who will be responsible for completing and conducting the evaluation for child find from 2.9 to three years of age. So I'm going to say that again. The SAU is responsible for identifying that child with a disability. And that means that as soon as you get signed consent, you can deliver that to the Department of Education and get $1,000 for that child. Here's another thing I'm gonna tell you. If that child meets the criteria for developmental delay and that evaluation or process has been done a year prior to the transition conference, then that child can qualify at the third birthday as a developmental delay because it's the same criteria. And we know in special education land an evaluation is good for a year. In this age, I'm telling you things do, they do go quickly, but in terms of process, um, what you might elect to do if the child qualifies and has pretty current information, you can qualify the child with a developmental delay and create an IEP and um, order further evaluations to see if there's another condition that is requiring your attention. However, you have already qualified that child under developmental delay. And so you have met the federal threshold. The federal government is very unhappy with Maine. We're only 56% compliant. And I think that it's also a misunderstanding in CDS about this. And so we're working, Ariana, myself, and Sandy are working to give CDS some training around how to qualify children at the third birthday. You do not have to wait for the evaluations if you are already qualified under developmental delay. And at the same time, you can conduct further evaluations. And we all know in special education, sometimes that evaluation won't be effective until the third grade. We know that because we've been doing this. But um, so I just want you to know that 2.9 to 3 is really your job, your lift. However, you also don't need a school psychologist to conduct that evaluation. So let's say you're with a child who doesn't have a recent evaluation. You can send somebody in to do a BDI. And that's the information that you have. That's not a school psychologist. It's not required. Autism, school psychologists are required. Specific learning disability, you know those differences. But developmental delay can be a certified special ed teacher who is trained in providing an evaluation to look at developmental delay. So you are all going to be accustomed to this and we're gonna keep saying it. Uh, we did just have a training with Sarah Forster on part C and the legal onus for that transition to C to B is not part C, it is part B and it's always been CDS. And now that we're transitioning, it's something you're gonna wanna keep track of. Um, so we'll talk more about that. We have more trainings prepared. I know, um, Sue, you reached out, you have a couple children coming in. And so you're, um, if you have any, um, if you have any questions or need some individual support about that, we'd be happy to, um, connect with you. All right. So next is a fiscal update from Paula Gerbel. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, so I'm about to give you a bunch of information, but the good news is 
after this meeting, Jen Hopkins will be sending what I say in writing. So you're going to have documentation in writing as well as what I'm about to explain to you. So there's um, a lot of question about the upcoming October 1 count and how we're dealing with that and then how we are then using that to calculate the second quarter of funding for all of the cohort one SAUs. So the documentation that we're going to be sending you <clears throat> after this meeting, <clears throat> excuse me, one second, will hopefully be clear uh, in explaining it. Um, but I'm going to go through a couple things. So the first thing that I want everybody to understand, especially you business managers, Joe, uh, superintendents and business managers, um, is that the funding for quarter two, we realize you expect to have it as soon as possible after the quarter begins. As a result of that, our plan is to be able to have a calculated adjustment ready based on the counts that we collect on the October 1 count to send out by the 15th of the month. So we are planning to have you do the count, the October 1 counts, submit them to us by October 8th, give us a few days to calculate, and then we will send quarter two allocations based on that information. That being said, keep in mind that this will likely only be a result of the counts collected on October 1, which I'll, I'll explain how that will happen in a minute. And because of the short turnaround time so that we can get the payments to, out to you quickly for the second quarter, we likely will not have time to review any additional costs that you believe or, or that, that you have over and above what we have already calculated funding for. So we still want you to send them in as we've asked, the IEP, the invoices, all that documentation. Our team will review it as soon as it can. And if we do determine that there's additional funding required for these additional costs, for whatever reason, um, related to these uh, the student IEPs, uh, if it's warranted and required, we will likely, we will, we will be able to, if necessary, give another payment for that addition, those additional funds in this quarter prior to the next quarter payment, which would be uh, January 15th. So I hope that helps to clear it to um, calm people's nerves if uh, they're afraid they're not going to have enough funding for whatever reason. So the next thing I want to share is a spreadsheet. And the reason we're using a spreadsheet for count collection is twofold. Number one, we need these before the October 1 counts are finalized in the NEO, uh, not NEO, excuse me, in the Synergy State Information System. We need these within a week of October 1. So we have created, Jennifer and I and, and a bunch of others have worked together to create a very simple spreadsheet that we will ask each of you, each each of the 17 cohorts, SAUs, to fill out, get send back to Jen by the 8th of the month, by October 8th. This is who are your students in pre-K with an IEP, and who are your students that you have in child find with assigned parental consent for evaluation? Who are they? as of 10-1. So these will be any students that have come to you and you've enrolled in this program, enrolled in your pre-K since July 1. So in this three month period on October 1, who are the students that you have enrolled in this program? That Those are the numbers that we will then use to adjust your funding that we've already determined based on the, the estimate counts we had before. For October, if the counts are lower than what we had originally estimated, we will reduce the funding accordingly. But that is the only quarter we will reduce funding. We, we will increase funding if your numbers have increased. And then the next two quarters, January and April, we won't reduce if your numbers have reduced in those quarters. We will only increase 
if they've increased, but we will not reduce again. October, however, we are reducing because we used estimate counts and these are actual counts. So just trying to explain that. I'm gonna share my screen to show you what the spreadsheet is going to look like. At the same time that you're doing the spreadsheet, we also need you to be enrolling the students into your regular student information system and Synergy. And the uh, MEDEMS support team is prepared to help with any questions about that. The document we're gonna be sending has that information for you as well. Sharing screen. Spreadsheet. Okay, so hopefully you can see this spreadsheet. Okay, so it's very simple. The date is always 10-1. We only wanna know who are the students as of 10-1 that you have enrolled because we have to have a specific date. Then we're asking some simple questions, attending district, which would be obviously the S your SAU. The resident district, if they live in your district, great. If they live in a different district, we just need to know that. Resident town, which town do they live in? Is this student on a superintendent's agreement or not? In other words, if they do live in a different district, we have asked you to do a superintendent's agreement. So if they do live in a different district other than yours, there should be a superintendent agreement on file. Where is the service provider location? This is a question because we understand that you may not be providing the service in your schools, but you are responsible for the services being provided in a different location. We would like to know where is that location for each of these students. Um, also, just in case the service provider location and the FAPE provider location are different, I'm guessing that shouldn't be the case, but just in case if it is, we, we would need to know that. And then of course, the last name, first name, if there is a state student ID, which there would be if the student has been enrolled in the, in the state synergy system. If there is one already, please supply that. And then just different demographic, uh, sex, birth date, age on October 1, we can figure that out if we have to. The grade, obviously this should be pre-K. Um, and then if, if, if it's a child find student, yes or no that they are ch in child find, and then yes or no if you have parental consent for evaluation. The difference is by October 1, if they have not had the evaluation yet, then they would be in child find as long as there's a parental consent. If they have had the evaluation and there is no IEP, then, but you, but they were in child find during this three month period, put them here and we will give you that $1,000. If they have had the uh, evaluation and there is an IEP, you should include them in the regular calculation because that's more funding than the thousand dollars for waiting for evaluation. I hope that's clear. Um, so this is what we're asking you to each one of you to fill out by October 7th based on the October 1 uh, counts. You'll be sending that to Jen. I'll be used, I'll, our team will be using that to calculate the funding for the second quarter determine if it's the same or different from what the original funding was was calculated at for the first quarter payment. Get that out to you by the 15th of the month. And then we will still be looking into high cost items that you feel are necessary that you would be sending documentation for over the next few months before the next collection period, which is January 1st. I'm gonna stop talking. Any specific questions about any of that? those wonderful words I said? I hope all of you heard the, we are paying you by, by October 15th. That's my, that's the biggest thing that I can do is get the money to you then, hopefully. Okay, is it possible to get the original calculation? You should have that, but yes. Yep. Thank you, um, and we know, um, no, I'm gonna, I just wanna share one more resource before, as you guys know, Governor Mills has had a major 
initiative to expand and support children in this age group, not only in the educational world, but in the private daycare provider community. So with that, I just want to share quickly with you um, my screen, and now I can't see, I'm not sharing anything, am I? Nope, I'm not. I'm going to try to share my screen, but I don't think that I'm going to do it. <laughs> no, I got it. Can you guys see my screen? No. Okay. I have just gotten an external monitor and I am struggling with understanding how to use it. But the chart that I'm going to give you, they have increased the child's care subsidy. And I don't know if any of you who are on this call can bring it up. Um, 125% over the poverty rate, which means that parents can access funding for childcare to add to whatever programming you're providing, even if they're earning money that doesn't seem like it would connect to that. And I think you'd be surprised at how, I mean, for children, I think it's $100,000 um, so it's 125% over the poverty rate. It breaks it down monthly income and weekly income. And this is the child care subsidy. So when Susie shows you the graph that says, this is the little section of program that we're going to provide you. You want to add more? This is one thing that you might be able to use. And you might not think you're eligible because you don't meet the federal poverty rate index. And you know that. But in Maine, we are trying to support people in accessing that. And we also know the poverty rate is really out of date, right? Like it's no one can live under the federal po poverty rate. So I'm going to send that to all of you to share widely. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Nicole for the win. Um, so we are going to share that widely with you and it can be part of your conversation with parents when they, um, they're saying, well, how am I, how am I going to do the rest of this program? Or this doesn't make sense to me. Um, it's just um, another talking point of resource that you can provide families for getting really the program that they want. So um, <clears throat> we'll pass that along. There's the income guidelines right there. Um, and you can check that out and distribute it. And again, I don't think you've ever had to know that and now you do. So um, <laughs> you want to have this resource handy, or maybe you did. I shouldn't assume that you haven't had children in, in child care. So um, that is all we have for you today. We are going to, yes, braiding and layering funding. We are going to um, meet with you next week. Uh, have a great rest of your week. And um, it's great to hear these stories. If if any of you have them, please share them with us because it's really why we're doing this work. And I think that you are going to quickly understand what the difference is of building these connections with your families and getting these services in place prior to the children coming to kindergarten. So anyway, have a great day. Bye. Thanks.